in way of paying my respects to elders past, present and emerging. What are we? Well, I'm going to go to the Aegiara Julie, in Gaingara, Daragul Diem, Nai Nurwa, Wayanga Nura, Dinura Gangu Mang Nura, Daragi Yore Yen Malayu Buria, Yu Dangara Guni Lung Lung, Didri Gor, Yana Jana Wibu Bulingami. Welcome everybody. Thank you for being here wherever you're tuning in from tonight. My name is Julie. I'm a very proud Darag woman. This is my country, the country of my mother, my grandmother, grandfathers and ancestors. My people have been here for over 85,000 years, taking care of country and happily welcoming others to our beautiful space. So on behalf of Darug people, welcome to country. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming us to country, Auntie Joy. We're privileged to be gathered here today and welcomed here on Darug land. I'd also like to acknowledge Darug people, elders past and present, and all Aboriginal and First Nations people tuned in and also in the room here today. Um, you know, I live in Parramatta, down the road on Boromadigal land, also Darug country. And, you know, to be practicing as an artist on that land where people have done so for many, many generations is a privilege. And yeah, it's exciting to sit here and talk tonight on this country. So thank you. Always was and always will be. Aboriginal land. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd like to welcome you all to tracks number three at that third installment for 2020, the final one. So I feel super lucky to be hosting with you. My name's Cal. I'll literally myself in a second. But we're live here from Leo Kelly Blacktown Art Center. Um, I watched the last two tracks really keenly as both the musician, um, but also just like a fan of the music industry and someone who's kind of on the peripheries of the music industry as well. So it's a really great program run by FBI Radio and Music New South Wales, just for you. I'm always a fan of things that kind of demystify the music industry, make it really, you know, in simple terms. It's a real simple way of like empowering artists with knowledge of how to link up, who to connect with, and how to do things outside of just making music. I've got a really sick panel. We're gonna introduce them in a second, but quickly, I've got Melody from 23, a PR and management company. I've got Emily from Music New South Wales. I've got Pavan from Sonda Films. Ash from YouTube. And Baka, MC and Hero. Let's get into it. <laughs> my name is Colin Jadir. People call me Cal. With my brother DJ Atro, I'm one half of independent electronic hip hop duo Slim Set. Um, I also host a show on FBI Radio with Kalimi, who's right now in Redfern holding it down. She's doing like a real, real slinky R&B show, show, you know. You can tune in, keep them both on at the same time. Shout out to Ketty. And I also run a little gallery in Parramatta as well called Pari. Um, yeah, we're going to get into it. A real sick panel. We're talking about backing yourself and equipping yourself with all the skills and knowledge you need to make your dreams a reality, including applying for grants, pulling a campaign together, and creating a vi effective visual content and more. And then at the end, Baka will give us a bit of a live demonstration. Wicka, wicka, wicka. <laughs> <laughs> um, but let's get into it. I thought maybe the best way to start was kind of at the beginning or kind of bigger picture thing. Uh, maybe a different way of approaching introductions. So I was thinking like, what is the music industry? You know, it's kind of really uni unique here in, um, Australia, because you've kind of got a mix of like government organizations, commercial organizations, you know, it's more than just the labels. So I might go around the panel as introductions and yeah, ask you all in really simple terms what it is you do, you know, like what is PR? What is YouTube? <laughs> what is music? Let's get into it. So I'll start my left to right. I chose Melody. the wrong spot. <laughs> <laughs> the perfect spot. So. Um, you work for 23? Yes. Doing management in PR? Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> what is it? What is it? Um, yeah, I, I, I run a PR a management company called 23. Um, I wish I didn't call it 23, I was just 23 at the time and <laughs> running out of time <laughs> to register a name. Um, but it's essentially a company that supports artists through. Uh, managing their careers, um, which involves uh, a lot of different things. It's, I guess, a um, combination of helping, I, I mean, at the centre, it's helping an artist get the vision that they have in mind happening and find the people um, 
to join them in a team to make that happen. Um, so oftentimes you're helping them find the right booking agent, um, publisher, perhaps they want a label deal, perhaps they really don't, don't um, and then helping them with some of the creative elements, but it's quite um, different depending on you know, what kind of artist you are and how much um, you want to take the lead on stuff as well. Um, and then on the PR side, I work um, basically to promote and protect an artist. Um, sometimes uh, with artists that are starting out and um, trying to find an audience, it's really just about finding the platforms that are going to connect these wonderful artists with people who will resonate with their music. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, that's, that's, I really, really love it because I also came from a um, background at FBI Radio, which taught me so much about how to support artists and give them a platform on different levels. And um, I just feel really passionate about being able to do that in a small way because I have no musical ability and I just kind of like watching from the outside and trying to help people uh, where I can. Thank you, thank you. I liked your saying, you know, about protecting artists too, as well as, you know, connecting them. So mm. I guess you don't hear many people say that. <laughs> <coughs> it's a wild world out there on the internet, so, yeah. Thank you. Emily, so what is Music New South Wales and what's your role? Okay, uh, Music New South Wales is the state music body for contemporary music in New South Wales. Um, we're funded by government, so Create New South Wales is our primary funder, um, as well as APRA AMCROSS. And we basically, our job is to try and develop the music industry and meet, make artists or help artists have sustainable careers help everyone in the industry have a sustainable career so that we have people making music throughout their whole life as opposed to just for a brief moment of it. Um, we find that a lot of the people who come to us are people who are trying to navigate the music industry and find a way through the, you know, all the different parts of it because it can be really confusing and I've worked in it for many years and sometimes I have trouble sort of trying to explain exactly what it is as one whole picture because it's, you know, we often refer to it as an ecosystem. So a lot of people who come to us are, you know, early career artists who are trying to navigate that system and, you know, we find that most artists, they get into music because they love music and then all of a sudden they're running a small business and they need to learn all the other parts of the business as well and, and work out where, what other businesses their business connects with and, and how that works. So yeah, it's a pretty complicated system sometimes, but so that's, we're kind of here to help people navigate it. Mm. And I think, yeah, it is always surprising, you know, as an artist going to the industry, it's like, whoa, there's <laughs> more than just writing tracks. So that's why this panel will be great, you know? Yeah. We'll try and unlock some secrets. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Pavan, what do, what do you do? Um, yeah, so basically, I started Sonda like three and a half years ago. Um, I just discovered the skill of like filmmaking. Um, and then, yeah, just started the company just to continually get work. Um, and then from there, just kind of branched out into like diving more into like the music realm, just because as a dancer previously, like my background as a dancer is like naturally drawn to music. So um, yeah, just diving into the music world and slowly working with artists and kind of diving into this whole music industry side of things. Um, but yeah, essentially we just create visual content for artists and we, we try to like not only just create like clips and uh, music videos kind of, um, we really aim to like build the whole like content and strategy and marketing around their whole like brand, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, essentially we shoot clips, but we try to just give extra in terms of like really like building with artists and trying to navigate the whole social media content world and just try to like educate them on that. Mm. Yeah. Which we'll definitely get into because it, it is a world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole other world, isn't it? Ash, this is a good, perfect segue into you. <laughs> yeah, so I work in one of those worlds. Um, I'm the Asia Pacific Head of Culture and Trends at YouTube. So um, I'm a country manager for Australia as well, but look at predominantly Japan, Korea, and India. And I have the best job for me. Um, I basically try to understand popular culture by understanding what's popular on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I could look into your consumption habits, for example, Cal, like I can't obviously, <laughs> but if, if I could, that would, tell, <laughs> that would tell a story about you. Mm. Um, what I can do is I can see consumption um, uh, in aggregate. Um, and what that allows me to do is, is to be able to 
do research and tell stories about society or culture at large because what we watch, what we consume, um, tells a story about many things. You know, what, what we're striving for, what we're scared of, um, what we relate to, um, what makes us feel at ease. And yeah, I basically uh, just try to understand culture through the lens of what is like the biggest video platform in the world. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and I'm excited to get into that. I feel like YouTube plays such a, has played such a like big role in a lot of different cultures emerging. And it's nice to hear it, I don't know, talking about the storytelling of data, you know? Um, maybe we'll get into that as well. And what that means on an artist level. Um, finally, Baka. Oh. Oh, sorry. Nai, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Baka. Um, I'm a proud Malim Gampa Baka in Jinoku. Um, I'm living on Gelengara Nation, just a little debrief, um, which is also known as Marylands. Um, for me, I guess I am a First Nations female artist. Um, I came on the scene around March, but I've been rapping since I can remember. Um, I guess um, what I do is just, um, I guess live my truth. Music has always been um, um, a saviour, I guess for me. Um, something that keeps me strong and something that keeps me sane. Um, so I've always had music as an outlet for me to get through, get through life and to um, navigate through things. So, um, yeah, I guess, um, yeah, that's me. <laughs> that was no, no, it's so exciting to have you on. I think it's really good to have an artist's perspective and it's, yeah, amazing to hear more about you. You know, I'm a big fan, so I'm excited to get more on. And it's also interesting that you've been rapping for ages, but only, as you described, burst in the scene in March, you know? What yeah. an entrance, too. Let's go. It's like WWE theme song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, let's get into it. So, I was thinking, let's start at the beginning with a hypothetical. Um, let's do like a little how to release your music guide. I'm an artist. Let's say I'm an artist based in the West. I've got a couple of tracks under my belt. I recorded it in my bedroom, my friends, my mom loves it. Um, what's the next couple of steps for me, you know? How do I go from just sharing a link on my personal pages to my friends to like, I guess, increasing my reach? You should, I feel like naturally I should kind of lead to you, Melody. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Um, I think there are many ways you can release music and there's really no formula in terms of like, what it needs to sound like, what it needs to look like. I think um, maybe this is getting too ahead of myself, but when you make music that is authentic to you um, and you know rep represents who you want to be and what you want to say, it really is so much easier to connect with people because I guarantee there's other people going through what you're going through. Or um, you know, so I think like first and foremost, focusing on making the art that really feels true to you, like you were saying. Um, and then once you're ready, um, I think it's just important to make sure that, like sometimes it's really practical, like get your, get all the masters together, get a photo that represents you um, together as your like press shot, get your artwork together um, and collate all of those assets, that's what they call them, um, and just make sure that it's like ready, ready available. But I think um, beyond those like basic steps, it's really an interesting exercise to look at um, your community and assess like who uh, who's around you, like what support resources are around you, whether it's like local radio stations, it could be FBI, it could be something else, um, or it's like other musicians and creative people around you who are also releasing music, like finding out um, how they do things and even just looking at yourself, like where do you find the music? How do you enjoy, um, you know, uh, how do you enjoy, or like where do you go to find these things? And try and replicate that because I think rather than looking at what you think you need to, like where you need to hit, you know, like which websites to hit or like, yeah, who to send it to, I think you should send it to people you think will resonate. And then that way, and I feel like Ash will have a lot to say about this too, but then like your community can raise you up too, rather than depending on like someone in the music industry um, to do that because labels lie. <laughs> they have a lot of infrastructure, but it um, doesn't mean that they know how to connect 
something to someone else. So I do that. But you know, the the gaps that I've missed are, I guess, like um, finding contacts and emails to the places you think would would actually um, enjoy it too, and, and reaching mm -hmm. out and saying, "This is who I am. This is my music. Here's a link to my assets. This is when I'm going to release it." Try and give yourself like some uh, like few weeks to just really get it out to the right people. But I would say find your community first and then um, go out. Bit vague, but no, you think, know what I mean. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like I actually had a point exactly like that later on. I think particularly in this like data-driven world, we're so obsessed with you know followers, likes, and you know your numbers, your streams. But actually, yeah. it's so important to kind of start off with the community. Mm. Um, yeah, and like knowing, thinking about what you like, and then yeah, maybe um, maybe Baka, you can speak to that. Yeah, like I agree heaps with like starting in your community. Um, and like being truthful as well is um, yeah really massive because mm. you know there's things that you can write a whole bunch of stuff and be like you know I guess that was me finding my authentic self who did I want to come out as and did I want to come out as a phony or did I want to come out as real and I guess that's um, what you got to do you got to kind of like sit on like who ask yourself who are you like who am I and all that stuff as an artist and. Mm. What sort of message do I want to portray? Um, who am I speaking to? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ash, I might take it to you. What do you think is like a good kind of starting point for someone who maybe is like finding their voice, they've got a couple of tracks under their belt. What's the next step? I think, um, Pavan, you'll probably co-sign this, but I think having video assets that are authentic to who you are um, and that tell a story in and of itself. And I can cite many examples from Australia um, in the last couple of years that have really helped break artists. Mm. So I think um, we were talking about this before the, the stream, um, but you know, music, the music itself is just one touch point mm. for an audience. And you know, if you're in someone's ear through a, through a streaming service, um, you know, that's kind of one dimension of a way that they can engage with you. Mm -hmm. And I think um, music videos, obviously, is, is what I know a lot about. Um, the power of music videos is that they um, give a face and an, an identity, a visual identity, um, to the music. And it creates a different type of cultural product um, that people can kind of fall in love with, um, mm. that can actually get you noticed that can actually um, get people, you know, create different um, funnels for people to find you. Um, video in general, I think, is a really great way to um, create um, cultural products beyond songs and albums in and of themselves. Even, even something like, um, you know, live performances, for example. Like, probably everyone on, on this panel has probably <coughs> discovered an artist because they watched a live performance mm. um, on somewhere like YouTube. You know, you have channels like, um, you know, Tiny Desk, um, NPR. Um, yeah. That is a almost as much a music discovery service as it is a mm -hmm. live performance mm. um, platform. Um, so I think thinking about the way how you can create cultural products beyond the song itself to give your brand color to, to show people who you are and to showcase your creativity or your point of view or your talent in a different way um, is a great way for you to find new audiences and find audiences in places that you actually probably weren't looking or, or weren't expecting. Mm. I think that's a great point as well, you know, it's not just music videos, you know, mm -hmm. um, which are of course like a huge part and you know, I'm sure we all have many music videos we love yeah. and like, mm. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I never thought about that, like the Tiny Desk Concert or Color as, as like a discovery <coughs> platform. And actually, yeah, you know, just like, I don't know, even lo-fi body videos have such a quality to them, you know, just seeing your mm. artist doing what they love, you know, I'm sure everyone at home can think of an artist that they love watching just in the studio or hang out with friends and you actually do like, yeah. you know, fall in love with that artist. Mm. Um, we've, we've actually seen way more of that during this year, obviously, um, during the global pandemic where You've actually people assume they need to hit a certain like production 
level mm. to put mm. content out, but because you know um, people don't have access to like drones and 4K cameras or, or location shoot locations mm. or um, you know even crew production crew, you've seen this like um, democratization of mm. creativity and the visual language where um, you know people are comfortable with filming themselves on like a webcam on their laptop and yeah. like even something like you know Justin Bieber and um, Ariana Grande they re released a video this year that was like self shot and like artists that big yeah. are putting mm -hmm. out videos that look like you know a video that someone themselves could shoot on their phone mm. at home um, yeah definitely the Kalani yeah. quarantine video yes, as well exactly yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that's yeah. an interesting point and I guess it goes into the next thing where kind of still thinking about visual identity as an artist who's starting off. You know, it can be really intimidating, I think, you know. Recording the music is one thing, but then, you know, you know, outfits, look, you get really intimidated by a kind of like a high pressure or like a, a real image of the world, you know, how, how you should present yourself. I think people are so focused on visuals. Um, sorry, give me a second. Yeah, I was thinking like, do you guys have some tips maybe on like, how to curate or like present a visual identity for yourself as an artist who's starting off? Hmm. Yeah, take a <laughs> yeah. um, man, to me, I feel like the main thing is just like genuinely be yourself. Mm. And I think like to me, like this whole like any sort of like um, art form, I I'm like the mentality guy of just like I think like let's figure out you know where you sit and how you view the world um, before you go out and do anything. So to me, it's kind of like, if you have the mentality already of like, I need to dress a certain way, do a certain thing to get a certain whatever it is, it's like, that's like the, that's the bandwidth of like the game that you're kind of playing. But mm. if you're like, hey, I'm trying to be me and like, it might take 10 years for me to like reach my audience, that's a different game. You're mm. like, cool, I'll just wear what I need to wear. But if you're like, if I need to do something right now, I need to put on some like, new stuff, you know, like I need to put on the fancy like Gucci or whatnot and kind of like, yeah, like show what you need. But to me, it's just like, you just need to find out who you are and what game you're kind of playing. Mm. So like, yeah, I'm like kind of weird answering like differently, but I just feel like I wouldn't focus on like what I need to visually present like all the time in mm. terms of like right now. I'm just kind of like, I would tell everyone to just think about who you want to be in the long term mm. and then reverse engineer it back to being like, cool, how do I reach that point? And I feel like it's more long term. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel that's really refreshing advice as well. You know, like obviously we're in such a visual world now, but it's nice to think, you know, like, yeah, think forward and then think back. Yeah. I feel um, like in general, like, there's, you could wear anything or be anything and someone's going to like it. Mm. Like, if you like something, there's 7 billion people in the world, someone else is going to like it. Mm. So if you like wearing like a pink hoodie and it's like, does that suit my thing? It's like, someone else is going to like the mm. pink hoodie. And it's like, you just need to do you, and the right people are going to come. So yeah. I, f I feel like that, yeah. It's interesting, though. I feel like, is there still, you know, I feel like nowadays it's like you have to do the music video with the single, or it doesn't get as much traction, you know? But I think, Barker, it's like when you released your single for my titters, I was like, whoa, this is like, I didn't need a visual, you know what I mean? And then when the visual came, I was like, oh, like, <laughs> you know? It, it added to it, but I was already like, I don't know, really into the track. And so, I don't know, is it still, a general question I was gonna ask was, is it still worth doing that thing of like music video, music video, or is it, you know, is the audio still as important? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. I, I would say that, you know, like uh, music is obviously an amazing art form in itself, so people are gonna connect with that um, in their own way. It can also be like the, re the reality is also you just, might not have the budget or you might not have the resources or the time to put together videos so I don't think it like I don't think you have to have it but I think also maybe it's people changing their perspective on what um, they think it needs to be like you were saying before Ash it doesn't have to be you know crazy production but you can put things up even if it's like a diary entry it really like if you think of the things that you have discovered and it's like pretty pretty different but you don't have to release you don't have to do anything mm. you know like there are no rules it's just some sometimes things will connect um, and if you feel like you're the kind of person that can better represent yourself on video then maybe it will be helpful for you but you also might not be that kind
kind of person. So if you feel like you've got a really strong song and you don't know how to execute a video that like does it justice, maybe don't. But one thing I will say from, from a publicist perspective is that it's, um, it's quite hard to release a song and a video separately because we don't have much press in Australia. Um, you know, like we have in comparison to like America, we have maybe, uh, I don't want to give a number, but a very small amount that are influential in, in their presence. So um, I've completely lost what I was going to say, but um, yeah, you don't have that much of a chance to like be on ex for the same song more than once in like mm. the span of a couple of weeks or a month or something. So like there are so many artists, so many people releasing music every day, you're not, um, you'll be lucky to get their attention twice. Um, well, you know, everyone deserves a, a, a slot. So if they, if the editors are trying to make sure that a lot of different things are covered, then it is kind of unfair to get mm. them to repost it. But then again, that's if you're relying on press coverage, but you might want to actually focus on building your own subscribers and audience anyway, and building your own platform so you can go direct to people. So yeah, there's so many factors. It, mm. it really depends on your goals. I guess the flip side of that question I was thinking was, um, do you think it's still worth, open to anyone, do you think it's still worth doing EPs and mixtapes or albums? Or, you know, we live in such a kind of short attention span age, all songs are two minutes 30 now with a tight music video. Should, we, should it just be singles from now on? Like, what's your advice to artists? Do what makes sense to you. Mm. I think like every, there are so many different types of artists and so many different types of um, ways to release music. I think if you're an artist who really believes in you know, a set of songs and doing an EP is really important to you, release one, mm. you know, work on that. Some people are trying to chase, you know, sort of building it incrementally or through through individual singles. I think there's no right way to do anything. Mm. Um, and you just should just do what makes sense to you as an artist and what you feel comfortable putting out. Mm. In saying that, I think it's also helpful to build momentum mm. um, and build your audience through regular releases. Mm. So, um, you know, in terms of I, I'm no, um, I don't really know much about how streaming works and algorithms and that kind of thing, but from what I've heard, <laughs> it sounds like it's important to um, be able to, uh, you know, get new things into people's algorithms. Didn't um, um, Mr. Spotify say that? Exactly, exact thing, constant releasing is the way to go. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it is helpful to mm, grow your absolutely. audience. Absolutely. But um, I would also say without talking too much that it, it, um, it's also really fun for the artist to, to make their first album or mm. it's also really fun like particularly in different genres like maybe in hip-hop mixtapes are so much more um, like a rite of passage too like mm. you it depends on the kind of um, art that you're producing so something might feel like it's a bit more casual and rough and you want to call it a mixtape and you, but you can, you can call anything anything you can call it a project you can call it whatever but I think um, there are definitely rules with certain press outlets that are like we only we don't cover EP reviews we only do album reviews or we don't do interviews with singles we only do it for this so like sometimes there are those um, boundaries and limitations but yeah mm. cool all right yeah release whatever you want <laughs> I, th I think the idea of like a structured um, like form of creative expression is just like a construct. So mm. this idea that you need, um, I mean, e even the idea that you should like consistently um, release videos could be contested. It, it mm. is whatever works. And I think good music will find a way um, to gain an audience mm. um, regardless. But, you know, as, as Melody said, an, an EP, um, a mixtape might work for a hip hop artist or, you know, a, a 12 inch A side, B side for a, for a mm. dance music. Uh, electronic producer makes sense. Um, what I do know is that in terms of um, the music video, it's probably easier to service um, in conjunction with the single just because mm. it gives the audience something to look at while they while they read an article. And it's um, probably, you know, I've, I've come from um, digital media as well, always preferenced a, um, a release that had like mm. an embed mm. code that I could just put into a post. 
Um, but beyond that, um, having a clip out there in the world um, actually creates now these new forms of uh, like exploration of you as an artist. And um, like we, we can probably talk about um, your clip. Uh, yeah. uh, say it again, uh, one four. Mm. One four have literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, not from Australia, predominantly from the US and the UK, make reaction videos to yeah. their videos. Mm. Um, it started with the message, and probably um, that's a really great example of what a music video can do, because that song slaps, but the clip slaps as well. So it's yeah. this yeah. double thing Iconic. of people being like, this is a banger, but also this is the hardest shit I've ever seen. Mm. And um, <laughs> that, that creates an impression. And, um, you know, they, they, have like a, they have a YouTube first release strategy, mm. um, which yeah. is interesting because what that means is you can't hear the music without watching the video. Yeah. So the experience isn't divorced. It's, it's like if you want to hear the track first, you have to watch mm. the music video. Um, and there's all this you know, anticipation around it. Often video reaction videos to their videos will trend on YouTube alongside mm. the music video. So there's this wave of kind of like shoulder content related to that, the main thing. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, the work out what makes sense for you, like not everyone needs to make a music video. And I, I certainly don't think that um, the presence of a music video um, can stop a great song from finding an audience. Mm. What it does is um, it allows um, people like, you know, dudes in their bedrooms in the UK or the US to um, experience um, you as an artist in a different way. And I don't think that can be um, under, understated how, how valuable and how powerful that can actually be. Mm. It was really interesting with the one four thing, seeing like, yeah, the wave of reaction videos. You know, I was clicking on all of them. I was sitting there laughing, <laughs> yeah. watching the video again. Yeah. Um, but it, I, I like the point of, you know, it kind of goes back to like, good music will stand out, you know? People will share it with their friends. People will react to it. Um, and it's good not to get, it's easy to get bogged down in, you know, I need a plan, I need a strategy, but actually, you know, good music holds up. Um, I want to get into music stuff, music video stuff in a second, but Barker, I wanted to quickly ask, um, did you have a clear plan coming in? You kind of said at the start, you have been rapping for a while, yeah. but then March was when you kind of hopped onto the scene, or, yeah, was it, did you have a clear plan or? I just winged it. It mm. kind of just happened. Like, um, sh shout out to Steph Giaghi. He, um, he like believed in me and he was the guy who helped me out getting my first music clip and, um, you know, getting me around the technicalities of it. But yeah, in 2019, I was just rapping in my bedroom. Like I was pretty much just doing like me, my bedroom, my phone playing the beat and then just like spitting it raw. And, mm. I think like if you've got a dream and you know and you really love it, just go for it. Yeah. Mm. Don't let anything hold you back. Just do. You won't regret it. I mean there's nothing to lose mm. when you're going out and trying new things. So um yeah, I didn't really have a plan. It was just like it's still like, whoa, is this happening? Mm. <laughs> hey guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Does it get more structured the further you go, or are you just still kind of like? I feel like because now I'm with Bad Apples, it's, there's more structure around, mm. um, like what I bring out or how I'm going to bring it out. Mm. But um, they like with my creative, I can still be me, which is awesome. Um, I still put up the random rap video in the bedroom, so yeah, um, that won't stop me. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean that's you know a testament to like good music and like you know people wanting to hear something but not knowing it yet. You know, like really, you know, we're going to come back to it. I think time and time again, but like community who will listen to you and love you. You know, um, I think I really also love the point you made of um, what do you have to lose? You know, I think particularly why I've been so excited to see you come up uh, is I feel like we've, you know, there, there's a new wave of like fem MCs in Oz around the world, but I'm still waiting for like, you know, a more like, like more staunch ones. And so I was so excited to hear you come mm -hmm. up. And I just wanted to ask you quickly, like what, you know, advice you might have for, I guess, young girls who want to rap or like a way to give them the same kind of confidence that like 100 dudes have to get in front of a camera, you know what I mean? With like, no, no worries. 
<laughs> yeah, um, I guess um, when I was young, I wanted to say me on the screen. I wanted to say somebody who looked like me making something of themselves. So I grew into that person that I wanted mm. as a kid. Um, for my young sister girls out there, there's some, um, you know, there's that thing of intergenerational trauma, which is also there's shame that comes from intergenerational mm. trauma where we are told to be ashamed of who we are, to be ashamed of the colour of our skin. And I guess, you know, that stuff that's embedded into us for years and years and years is like, now we've got a whole mob going, oh, I'm too shame, I can't do it. I'm too embarrassed, that shame job. Mm. But it's not like, there's, there's no um, word in our language that translates to shame. So therefore, you know, be who you are, embody your matriarchal power, embody mm. your fem feminine energy, like be that, you know, strong, proud sister that you need. And, um, and I feel like all, our, you know, all my sister girls and all the young ones coming up, there's like, the future looks really, really mm. deadly, you know? And um, yeah, I feel like, um, you know, if I can inspire young sisters to pick the mic up and start rapping, then my job done mm. there, you know, like... Not done, you've got to keep going too. <laughs> oh. <laughs> all right. <laughs> if you insist. <laughs> yeah, but you're right, you know, like... Mm. Yeah, shame is a complicated thing. Um, mm. All right, Pavan, I wanted to ask you. You produced some great music videos. You know, we touched on, of course, the big one for an ASAP Ferg one, but also, mm -hmm. you know, Becca Hatch, Nookie. Um, how close do you work with an artist and their team to produce their vision? Um, for me, like, it's kind of been a journey because, like, I've been slowly trying to find my way in how I want to approach working with artists because, yeah, I feel like I'm trying to adjust and trying to, like, make it better each time. Um, but I would say at the start or like earlier on, I think like when we're working with some of these artists, um, yeah, we just kind of like, for me, it's just getting to know them straight away. It's just like before we even like talk about like what ideas or what the song is, like any of that, it's just like, again, I'll just be like, who are you? What are you aiming for in five, 10 years? Like who are you trying to be? Um, just so I can try and like have some creative or like visuals to like match that and kind of build that story so that the audience can connect with that. Mm. But I think it always just stems from like who you are. So I think, like, for the most part, like, even the first meetings, it's kind of, like, nothing to do with the video. It's kind of, like, all right, like, tell me about yourself, like, mm. origin story to, like, now and, like, like future. Um, but, yeah, so for us now, like, we're mainly focusing on, like, building, like, I, like we don't want to shoot clips anymore in terms of, like, hey, like, let's just do a music video and then kind of, like, leave. Like, what we're trying to do is really, like, understand the artist and build everything around that. So whether it's their shows or as you said, like putting a phone in your bedroom and like recording that, mm. like we try to tell them that kind of stuff. Mm. Cause like you don't need us all the time. Yes, you might need us for like maybe higher production like things, but it's like, we want to give you like ideas to connect with your audience and your community by understanding who you are. So like even approaching it, it's kind of like, we just do it super differently rather than like, cool, like let's shoot the clip. This is the ideas. Like that's like super like third, fourth step. It's kind of like, let's find out who you are um, understand where you're going and then kind of build like all these ideas around it and then it's like cool for this clip we start here and then like when we we hope to build with them to like create the story as we go along and mm -hmm. their progression that kind of makes sense I think yeah that's a lot but <laughs> no no, yeah. no I think it's an important thing in the music industry as well you know calling it industry makes it seem so like cold and like a factory yeah. but actually you know it's built on relationships you 100%. know yeah. um, your team around you is so important um, yeah and I think it's really interesting to hear you say actually the logistics of talking about the clip comes later and the first thing is actually, all right, who are you, you know? Um, something I've always wanted to ask a video producer or a filmmaker is maybe pet peeves is a strong word, but like <laughs> what are things you wish artists prepped more when they came to you or like what do you wish that they asked you more to do or like didn't ask? Yeah. Um... Honestly, I'm like a super chill guy, so like, like most things don't really get to me. But um, I had to think, man. To be honest, like, it's not really too much. Like, cause like in the first meeting, I kind of like flesh everything out. Mm. I kind of like make sure there's no like weird things of like this is not gonna happen or this is gonna happen kind of thing. So it's kind of like I'll try to like detail everything and kind of be like, cool, like this is exactly what's happening. Like. We need to rehearsal, we need to do that. Like, I'll just try to talk as much as I can so we like 
clear everything and like nothing should happen mm -hmm. i feel like the only things but it's just like maybe like being late or like yeah stuff like that yeah but otherwise being like late. <laughs> like that's just like annoying <laughs> but um yeah other than that like i'm pretty chill so i think i let things kind of slide because i know it's like bigger picture mm -hmm. kind of vibes so if something small happens kind of like still like let me just understand them and like still make it work yeah yeah yeah, cool. Yeah. <laughs> how, how, how tightly storyboarded is your stuff? Like, like the third clip, for example, are you just, have you like storyboarded every frame? You know what it is? Or you're just like putting it together in the so editing So honestly, room? like, I want to tell this to any filmmaker because it's like, for me, like, even getting starting, like, even getting started with learning how to like film, it was literally like out of camera and the ability to film or like take a video was the reason I started. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, this can do video. Cool, let me try. And I just started with that. So like, I haven't gone to film school. I'm just like learning on YouTube. Um, shout out, you shout out. Yeah, <laughs> like, for real, that, that's just the uni university like future, you know what I mean? But, um, <laughs> it is. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I just started learning like that. So then everything I was doing was just like learning off YouTube. And even till this day, I've never storyboarded. Mm -hmm. Like ever. It's like, I kind of do it in a weird way. Like maybe from my background of like as a dancer, I kind of like, think of like timestamps in the songs and when the feeling changes and like cool like this needs to change the scene in some way shape or form or like progress this way and I kind of try to tell the story how I would like choreograph a dance that kind of makes sense but yeah I've never storyboarded ever um the one for one was like literally a call last minute so that was like no chance to do anything I just like rocked up and like they helped me found like location and stuff so that was like a different thing but yeah mm. <laughs> No, it's sick. It's interesting to hear as well, like, you know, really responding to the moment in the song. Mm. All right, I want to start to ask a few awkward questions now, but we'll start, you know, I want to talk about money in this industry <laughs> and, like, really demystify it. Because I think starting off, you know, as a, with Atro in the industry, it was, like, really confusing. I was like, whoa, like, this costs this much. Videos cost this much. PR costs this much. <laughs> I was like, how can it be? Where does the money go? Um, but... I might actually start off with you, Emily. I'm really glad you're here because I think it's, you know, you're from Music New South Wales, mm -hmm. which is um, a government agency. And I think people actually don't realize, particularly in the music world, that there's actually money, grants, and stuff, and programs available for emerging artists and artists in general to produce work. So yeah, I wanted to ask you what kind of programs are there? Yeah, sure. So we run a whole range of programs at professional development programs focused at, um, you know, trying to help people get a leg up into the industry, kind of like this. You know, we focus on publicity. We've had people at like Melody come in before and do, um, you know, speak at our panels and masterclasses. We do things on, um, you know, forming a release plan if you want help doing that. Um, we talk about, like, social marketing, um, you know, all sorts of things like tour planning, um, and most of it's free and you can just come along and, well, things have slightly changed this year, but, you know, we've moved a lot of our resources and panels online, so you can just check out our website and um, see a whole range of things that basically, you know, have professionals like Melody and some of yourselves coming in and talking about um, how to navigate the industry from all those different standpoints and getting into some of the nitty gritty. Um, but we also do other resources like grant writing resources. We've mm. actually just released a, a three-part video series on grant writing, which goes into details around like how to do your budget and how to talk about what your project is and how to sort of plan out the grant and how to not, you know, ask for too much or too little or, you know, all those kinds of things. Because there's actually, you know, there's quite a few programs out there that can support you. So if you're looking to do a film clip or you're looking to, you know, uh, have a sort of, you know, six-month release strategy that you need some funding to pay for some publicity for or whatever it is, you can actually apply to a whole range of um, organisations and agencies. So mm -hmm. Create New South Wales is um, one that they do quick response grants. They're up to $5,000 and they, you can get them in a pretty quick turnaround and I know a lot of music people apply for those because they're, they're quite quick and they're a bit easier than some of the more bigger um, project grants which you can also apply to them for. Um, people at Blacktown Art Centre, they do grants as well, Blacktown um, Council, like for artists, for releasing music um, and, you know, for helping artists get by. A lot of, like, local councils, the Australia Council does um, funding, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of different people do funding. City of Sydney, um, yeah, 
there's, there, there, is, there is money out there. It's pretty competitive, so that's why we try and help people navigate what those grants look like because mm. they can be hard. You know, people will apply for one, not really know what they're doing, get knocked back and go, oh, it's too hard and give up. But actually, you know, you, you're trying to convince someone to invest in your career, so it's important to sort of put your best foot forward and not, mm. you know, go, you know, doing a half hour job and then wondering why you didn't get $10,000, you know? Like, you kind of got to work with the money. <laughs> mm. It's great as well. There are, you know, I highly recommend you know, attending these grant writing workshops as well, because mm. it is a whole different world. Okay, my time's silly. I'm just going to explain what a grant is, because, mm. you know, I didn't know what a grant was six years ago, and now it's all our writing. But um, <laughs> a grant is... Actually, maybe I'll ask you to explain I what a grant it, is. I can do it, yeah. Well, basically, it's a form you fill out asking for money, you know, yeah. and they ask you a whole range of questions. Um, there'll be... Um, it depends on the funding body, but, you know, um, say with Create New South Wales, for example, and their quick response grants, they ask you, you know, a whole range of questions around what you're trying to do, who you are, why this money is important to you and what you'll do with it, what your budget is for it, and, you know, any, if there's any risk around it not happening. You know, it's fairly mm. straightforward and, um, you know, you can... It's basically just, yeah, applying to them to give you some cash. And it really, um, happen, yeah. yeah, and it depends on, you know, the, the level of, you know, obviously the more money you apply for, the more work you have to put in and the more questions they ask. But some of the smaller ones, you know, $20,000 and under, like, you can do it, um, you know, that's not a heap of work. It's more about, you know, trying to put your best foot forward and be able to describe your work and what you do. Um, and why it's, you know, why it's timely for mm. right now and those kinds of things. So, yeah, I'd check out the grant writing resources on our website for Definitely. that if you're looking to um, find out where all the money's at. <laughs> yeah. Um, because it can really help, you know, if you're just having a little bit of investment to get you up so you can get a film clip made and then all those other things roll from that. So, yeah, it is, there are some good programs out there. Yeah, and definitely I think an important point is don't be disheartened if you get knocked back as well, you know. Grant yeah. writing is a kind of a weird skill that I feel like a lot of musos, particularly here, don't think is important. But actually, yeah. it can help, you know? There's money yeah. sitting there And also, there are people who can help you write grants as well. Like, you can call up Music New South Wales and say, I don't know what this question is. We'll help you, even if it's, we, we don't do grants anymore, but um, we'll help you sort of navigate all the other grants that are out there. We have a grants calendar, so you can don't have to go looking out there on the internet. You can just come to our website and find out where they all are. Mm. Um, it's pretty... Um, I would say, you know, if you're not a great writer, getting someone to help is always a good idea. Yeah. That's been my number one advice. Mm. And I think, you know, Music New South Wales and Create are great, but also look at your local council, you know? Yeah. Think really locally, as yeah. well as, you know, big organisations like Ozco. Yeah. yeah. There's money Blacktown. around there. Yeah, like a lot of the councils do. A lot of um, other organisations around as well, like not necessarily just government organisations, like... Um, yeah, some people just have a bit of money and they want to support the creative industry somehow. So, yeah, mm. it's worth having a bit of a look around. You don't just go to slog shirts nowadays, you know? <laughs> yeah, kind of. It's worth it. It's worth it. Um, Melody, on a similar kind of line, I might ask, you know, what kind of different packages do you have or, like, how do you kind of tailor your services to the artist? Yeah, um, I can uh, say that it really ranges. Um, it can be really startling to um, hear how much it can be for a PR campaign. Um, I think uh, I, I left um, the company that I worked for b uh, before to start my own because I um, really didn't, I didn't know how things were done, but I had a pretty strong feeling of how I wanted things to work. So. Um, I think like it can, a PR campaign, I guess it depends on what you're wanting it for. So it could be for one single, it could be for an EP or an album, could be for um, an EP and a tour, like it, it really depends. So I guess like um, the way that I try and work it out is, you know, how many months or weeks or, you know, how much time will I be spending um, on it firstly um, to cover my costs and then um, trying to find like, packages that feel fair to the artist. So, you know, you can, um, yeah, you, there, there are so many independent artists. And I think, like, from from also being a manager to only independent artists, I um, know that it can you can kind of, like, shoot them in the foot if you are asking them for, like, $4,000 for, a, you know, a single, which is, like, 
which happens, or an EP, and you know they're trying to promote themselves, but they don't really have the money to do anything once they have that audience. So, especially at the beginning, um, yeah, it can be tough. But to get like literal, um, you know, I might charge anywhere between like five hundred dollars to three thousand dollars for an EP. Um, again, depending on the time it takes. Um, also. I do, I do try and think about independent versus major label artists. Mm. Um, and there also might be the type of artists that need um, promoting, but also protecting maybe even more so. So for those artists, I might be on a monthly retainer where they can call on me to kind of like put out any fires, so to speak, at any given moment. Um, not that that happens that often, but you know it can happen too. So you can ask to have someone represent you constantly or um, that's pretty unrealistic for most artists, so yeah, it can range. But mm. somewhere between the fifteen hundred to three thousand mark is like pretty standard. Mm. Um, but that is a lot of money, and when you consider like videos and everything else, mastering, mixing, all of that, it can really um, get to a, uh, yeah to a big amount. But I would say that um, as a manager, you don't necessarily need someone else to do it at the beginning. Like you can you can really do it yourself. Um, I remember I've written to you and asked you <laughs> if I can work on your music because I just love it. But also recognizing, I reckon you could do it yourself right now. Like, um, you know, look at the friends that have radio shows or write for a zine or website or whatever. Like, it can it can even be someone help like promoting it. You don't really need it necessarily unless you have like really big goals that you're trying to get to as well. And then maybe it's helpful. Um, but hire me, but like you don't necessarily need me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you made a great point as well. You know, it's like uh, it's interesting. You said you consider, you know, whether an artist is independent or not. And I think it goes back to that point of how important it is to build relationships. You know, so that you know, if someone gives you a flat cost, you don't got to be like, oh shoot, I got to raise this much money. You know, it's like worth asking a bit more and being like, you know, what do you offer? I'm at this point in my career. You know, if I like what we do, you know. Can you help me out now? And then hopefully it'll pay off later. I think it's worth thinking like that. I will say one other thing that um, is important. Like, I think sometimes people, um, it, a, a PR campaign might not go well. And it doesn't mean that the publicist isn't doing their job. Um, sometimes things don't connect. Or sometimes it's not about the connection. But it could be a series of really unfortunate timing moments. Mm. So I think um, I've been on the other side where you know people have um, been frustrated by not having something and I try and truly work with excellence so I try and dedicate time to everyone that I've said that I would um, but sometimes it just doesn't work so I think like it's important to note that regardless of what you pay it might not be the results that you want mm. but um, you know so long as you know the person's doing it it's important and I would say in terms of backing yourself as a business owner it's also really important to think about um, you know your needs too and like, I try to work backwards, like, what's my rent? What's this? What's that? And try and figure out how much money I need to make to get by to do what I do. Um, and so it's also really important to be able to try and support the people in the industry too, especially when it's an independent business like mine, um, because those people are also working and giving you time um, from the skills that they have. So, yeah, it can be a lot, but it's also think about it also as well as, like, um, Supporting other people who want to support you too. So yeah. everyone, everyone needs money to get by. So. Yeah. If it does well, everyone eats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, no, but it's a good way to think. You know, I think it's easy to get caught up and be like, you know, forget rent, forget groceries. Like, yeah. oh no, I'm going to put it all towards this. You know, it's like really <laughs> big picture. You know. <laughs> and you want to see like small businesses and you know like artistic platforms like magazines like you want to support these things so that we're creating culture mm. as well like um, having independent businesses means that you don't always have to like go to big majors to get all the resources that you that you need like it's it's cool to support <laughs> local artists and local businesses because yeah, then you know we we're creating a really vibrant community for ourselves yeah absolutely you know everything really feeds off each other um mm. Ash, I want to take it to you. I want to talk about YouTube. I'm just being conscious of time. Sure. Um, I really live on YouTube. Like, it's <laughs> first thing, like, in the morning, you know? I'm, like, waiting for the algorithm to feed me. Um, it's actually, like, it knows me, you know, of course it knows me better than myself. Um, 
I want to ask you, like, what are trends you're seeing now on YouTube? We've kind of like, you know, touched on it mm -hmm. about, you know, the reaction videos and also like lower lo-fi content or mm -hmm. like, you know. Um, and yeah, what are these trends you're seeing and how can artists starting out use this knowledge to their advantage? So I'm reluctant to give like um, advice on micro trends or sh yeah. short term trends. Um, but what I will talk about is kind of longitudinal, you know, consumption and, and creativity trends that I'm seeing. And one of them, which is definitely accelerated by the pandemic, is um, live streaming mm. as a format, a way to feel um, urgent and um, to feel present by proxy with an audience who can't physically be in the same place as you. And there's been, like this year, so many great examples of how you can use live streaming to act as a kind of surrogate for, for live performances. Um, so. Live streaming is definitely one. We've seen artists all across the world um, stage concerts. Um, we've seen, um, you know, even someone like um, Bicep, for example. They they did a um, like a, a set that was recorded, but that had like visuals in it. So it was as live, but it was in and of itself kind of like an hour long music video. And what they did is they um, premiered it in different parts of the world at like 8.30 on a Friday night. So everyone could have the experience of like being in a club on a Friday night, like as the clock turned around the world. And, um, you know, you've had um, virtual bands, you've had, um, you know, virtual choirs, you've had, um, you know, all these fundraisers actually that um, have, have started from live streams. Um, and I think people, not just artists themselves and labels, but I think people are getting more comfortable with the idea of live streaming as an experience that is you know, not quite the same as, but still um, can be as valuable as um, actually going to a concert. And it's really cool because you can play for audiences that can't actually reach you, you know, in other mm. countries. Um, the other thing that I'll say is that um, uh, consumption is getting increasingly language agnostic. Um, ah. and, and culturally agnostic too, I might add. So, um, you know, on a, on a global front, you might think about the rise of um, K-pop or, or Spanish language reggaeton yeah. or, yeah. you know, dancehall. Um, reaching kids in English-speaking countries. So, you know, English as a language is no longer kind of has, you know, is the monoculture. Um, you know, people will listen to K-pop who, one, aren't Korean, but two, don't even understand Korean. Yeah, um, yeah. my sister. <laughs> yeah, uh, or, or, you know, the same can be said of, of reggaeton. And, you know, that's language, but if you take it to the cultural level as well, I think um, the idea that you have to be a certain thing or, or sound a certain way to be popular globally is kind of eroding. Um, I think Aussie hip-hop actually is a really great example of yeah. that, um, where, you know, you, no shade to her, but like Iggy Azalea, for example, she um, she obscured her Australianness. Mm. Um, whereas now, mm. the success of like all the um, you know rappers coming out of Western Sydney and other parts of Australia, they really lean into their Australianness. You mm. don't have to subscribe to some monoculture of what a rapper should sound like or, or should be. Um, and I think that's really cool. Yeah, it is cool. It's exciting yeah. to see. I guess that's a really interesting point. You know, the linguistically agnostic, you know, it's like language almost, not doesn't matter, but you don't even need to speak the same language to communicate. It anymore. matters less. It matters less, yeah. It matters less, yeah. Yeah, that's really, and you know, it extends your reach as an artist as mm -hmm. well, you know. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, thinking locally again, um, what, what has YouTube, I guess, you know, in maybe collective ideas, YouTube is kind of this huge online platform, mm -hmm. but, you know, what kind of things is YouTube doing locally and like what are they focusing on building? Yeah, so I mean in terms of supporting Australian artists like this year they've done um, uh, like concerts and, and fundraisers um, that went to Support Act. Um, Powderfinger actually reformed after a decade for this thing called One Night uh, Lonely that was live streamed on YouTube and I think they raised over half a million dollars for um, Beyond Blue and Support Act. Um, since last year YouTube also partnered with um, up the arias, um, and this I believe this year's arias we live streamed um, on YouTube as well. But I think beyond that, the value that YouTube provides to local artists is um, representation and distribution, without gatekeepers. So mm. not even that you um, you know 
you, you don't need a label to blow up. You don't need radio airplay to mm. blow up, which I think is really important because I actually don't think that um, you know, mainstream media represents at all what is actually popular in this country, in mm. Australia. And if you looked at the top um, artists on, on YouTube, the most streamed artists, it, I, I don't know if they're all getting played on um, radio commensurate to how big their audience actually is. So mm. I think that's the biggest thing that YouTube provides is this um, unfettered distribution that um, isn't reliant on any gatekeeper. Anyone can yeah. release music, anyone can drop a music video and they can actually circumnavigate being played on radio or being on a major label. Yeah. You um, also don't need to pay, you yeah. know, which is actually, you take it for granted, you yeah. don't need to pay to upload to yeah. YouTube. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of other things I could talk about, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I had something else. I was going to... Um, yeah, it's tricky, you know. I was thinking, again, you know, nowadays it's so data-driven, so focused, and yet I'm, yeah, you know, not going into micro-trends, but, like, there really is something so important about, you know, at the end of the day, like, stream numbers and things like that. There's a human on the other end listening to it, you know? So we're listening to music, things like that. I wanted to kind of bring it back to how important is that organic fan base? What are some ways you can, you know, reach out and stretch it? Sorry, broad question. <laughs> Matt, I feel like building just yeah, your audience and community, like basically it's just like, I feel like I should be number one priority for everyone. Mm. And it's like, you can do it everywhere. Like, like on Instagram, if someone, um, messages you like respond and like correctly like respond not like correctly but like pay attention mm. as in like don't be like cool and then just like you're just like someone is like yo someone's really paying attention to actually they're giving you their time to even message you it's like put some time and effort into like building mm. that relationship and I think like that should be happening like everywhere as much as you can if you meet someone it's like genuinely like if they're giving you their time and their effort to like even say something it's like you should like build upon that you know mm. like really like appreciate that and kind of build upon it but I reckon in terms of building like the community I think that should be number one strategy for like every artist because it's like there's so many different ways like one way which I don't think anyone I feel like not anyone's really like doing in Australia right now is like like text mass uh, text messaging platforms oh. um I don't know if you've heard about that or anything but essentially it's just like you have you like pay a monthly like subscription and stuff and it's like you have a certain amount of like hardcore fans or people who like want to be like access, like have your access like at all time, you know? So it's kind of like if you release a video and you have a hundred people on this text messaging, text messaging platform, you like can send the link to your newest, newest video and be like, check it. And it's like, if, if we got a message, no matter what, we're gonna check it. That's mm -hmm. like, the most access you would ever give anyone. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know if you guys get like random like domino, like <laughs> text messages and stuff like that. You're like, I don't need this, right? But it's like, if your artist did that to you and like, hey, here's like, um, like a sneaky like release or whatever that you might not hear until like a month later. People want that access and people mm. want that. So it's like, I would say everyone needs to think about that. Cause it's like, no, like that's like direct to audience again, like canceling gatekeepers. Mm. And it's kind of like, you don't even need to put it on a, any sort of like blog or anything, it's just like, just message your fans. I, and they I want to spread it out. I want to underscore the importance of, <coughs> of the community as you talk about, because mm. that's the thing that actually allows you to leapfrog everything. Because mm. that's, that's yeah. actually the like secondary value that you create as, as an artist is it's not just the, the, the cultural product, it's like your audience and your community. And like, you know, going back to, you were talking about, you watch all the reaction videos yeah, of, exactly. of, of these Aussie hip hop videos. and. Um, it's interesting because when you actually look at the data, like the majority of views of like US and UK reaction videos to Aussie Jewel, for example, are Australian. Yeah, it's and a it, weird. Yeah. It's, and it's it's a form of like cultural validation. You see it in the comments. Mm. It's it's representation for this like emerging Pacifica hip hop scene that's in Australia. And if you go to the kind of other end, you know, that's grassroots level. If you go to the other end, and like this is professional fandom. If you look at K-pop and um, you know fan armies, BTS's army, yeah. for example, like they set records, right? And like single day stream records for, for music videos for BTS. And it's almost as if um, 
setting that record is an achievement of the fandom mm -hmm. and not the artist. Yeah, it's true. And, yeah. and I think they have this crazy, huge global... I think it's the, the biggest music fandom in the world. They have this crazy global army that is capable of shifting culture. And there are so many examples of that. This year, for example, the BTS army hijacked... Um, yeah white supremacy hashtags yeah. uh, on Twitter and... Um, oh, shout out the BTS. Yeah. That's wild, right? yeah, and, and no one asked them to do this, right? Yeah. It was all... They're a self-regulated fandom, um, but they're so numerous and so engaged and so about being in this community that they can, um, you know, engage in these really interesting moments of activism. Mm. And um, they, they actually raised, like, a million... BTS... Um, donated like a million dollars to the Black Lives Matter fund and they matched that as fans within 24 hours. Not bad. And then bad. hijacked uh, White Lives Matter as a hashtag and then posted GIFs of, of BTS. Instead. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's an important takeaway, you know, like community, the people around you listening to music is like, is really the core of it, you know? Why do we make music? Why do we tell our stories, you know? Baku was saying, you know, it's like you wanted, you became the person that you wanted to see, you know, I think that's really beautiful. Mm. Um, you know, someone like Cursor is kind of, you were talking about how YouTube or like, there's so many different platforms now that you can bypass other things with fan, fan bases and your community. You know, Cursor is a great example. He didn't get any radio play up until recently, but was one of the highest, in my opinion, highest streaming artists in Oz Rap. Mm. Um, all right, we're going to wrap it up now. Thank you everyone for joining me. It's been a great panel. I hope you guys took some tips. Post some hate in the comments below. Uh, my address is... <laughs> uh, but stay online, because Barker's about to show you what she does, yeah? Shout out Music New South Wales once again. FBI Radio, of course. Leo Kelly, Blacktown Arts Centre, and Auntie Julie for the welcome. Keep it locked for Barker. Yay! <laughs> Solidarity, that's get a question.
Aim higher ribbon by your crew whopping hard knocks and show your babies what it feels like when you truly are loved. And let me tell you something, you ain't defined by your past. They tried to judge me for it. Look who gets to have the last laugh. Cause I go hard, throwing stones surrounded by glass. Won't get you nowhere. I ain't even ashamed of my past. I'm a proud black sister, so don't ever get a twist. They was aiming at my downfall, but they missed and turned to miss it up. Really quite exquisite, and my sisters keep it busy. We rocking out our culture with my elders as I witness. Let me break it down so you get it stuck in your head. A black woman raised you, so don't you ever forget. And I am bagging out my brothers, my brothers are warriors. But if you can't respect your titters, don't expect us to honor ya. Don't leave me here again, ma. I need you more than you could ever understand, ma. I'm broken and alone. I know we had a broken home. Stop thinking you need a man, ma. Getting chucked around the system. Need to take my hand, ma. Wanna go home, but you're too selfish on that needle. Think you bad to the bone. Was once good, but you turn evil and I'm sick of these thoughts. Was I ever enough? It seems that all I was taught, that I was always too much. And all I want is your love, but you don't want to come back. Yeah, you too sick on that crack to comprehend the impact. I only see you for an hour every couple of weeks. And I'm going through so much trauma, I find it hard to just speak. You're touching me in the dark, cause I'm not worthy of love. And I'll probably turn out like you, or laying up in a coffin. All I wanted was you, but I wasn't your problem. I guess I gotta figure out my own ways to just solve and want you to fight for me. Like you fight over drugs, want you to fight for me. Go ahead and fight for my love, want you to die for me. But you just died on me. So now I'm standing in the mirror feeling real lonely. Sorry, mummy, fight for me. Like you fight over drugs, want you to fight for me. Go ahead and fight for my love, want you to die for me. But you just died on me. So now I'm standing in the mirror feeling real lonely. Sorry, mummy. No excuse for my actions, I should have been a mum and now I'm living with regret Cause I passed on my trauma, I'm so sorry for the pain that you feel in your heart And if I could take it away, I would tear it all apart I tear myself up every day, I wish I had my baby back But when push came to shove, I didn't have my baby back I was caught up in the trap, I was fronting on your dad And my demons came in masses, was too weak to fight them back Don't blame me for what I did, put blame where it belongs I did bad on my own, having you was never wrong, you were a Blessing all along, just to blind the fucking see. Hating on who I am, please don't ever be like me. I should have fought for you instead of chasing these drugs. I should have fought for you. I should have fought for your love, should have been there for you. It wasn't fair to you, and you're so strong, my baby. I couldn't compare to you. I should have fought for you instead of chasing these drugs. I should have fought for you. I should have fought for your love, should have been there for you. It wasn't fair to you, and you're so strong, my baby. I couldn't compare to you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, shout out to FBI for having, having me. Uh, shout out to the panel and all the mob behind the scenes. And yeah.